A dark cloud descended upon the lake late that afternoon. Quentin and the others had breakfasted on the terrace, enjoying the spring sunshine, and gone for a walk along the winding paths that spotted the hillsides, and by the time they got back, the cloud was hanging there, spitting rain threateningly. Such changes in the weather were to be expected, even appreciated, within that thin belt of mountains, but this was no ordinary cloud. For one, it came lower than any cloud before it, its vaporous fingers lightly caressing the surface of the lake. Furthermore, amongst its writhing mass, sparks of rose and violet leapt and then evaporated, like sparks dancing over the eye. Despite this abnormality, hardly a word was spoken of it. Good thing we stretched our legs early, Quentin said cheerily as they climbed the hill leading up to the house. Perhaps it was out of desire to avoid disagreeing with his statement of normality that they kept quiet. So it fell to Quentin to continue the pleasantries, lest he suffer social embarrassment, and he added, Yes, yes, a very good thing indeed. This made them all breathe an internal sigh of relief, as it clearly marked his speech as self-directed. They retreated to the drawing room, sat down with books and cards and embroidery, such empty things as one passes one's time with on a cold afternoon while on holiday. However, none of them could quite stay focused on the task before them. The gaping window at the end of the room looking out over the lake, and the colossal cloud hanging over it, pulled their attentions repeatedly. Quentin frequently peered over the edge of his novel, such that he lost his place and reread the same page a dozen times. The three girls embroidered their rose petals as one misshapen lump, and the men at cards did not even notice that their deck was missing all its aces, which Humphrey had stolen for that queer habit of his. Soon they were all staring directly at the great cloud, which seemed to bubble and expand, darkening the glass with its presence. By 4pm it had filled up the entire window, and when Cordelia entered to bring them their tea, she loudly cried, How dark it is in here! and turned the light on. And yet they continued to stare. Honestly, you're like a class of school children unable to concentrate. It is only a cloud, after all, and a miserable one at that. She pulled at the great scarlet ropes on the wall, so that the curtain shut and the cloud disappeared, and they all awoke as if from a trance. There, and I suppose you've forgotten, Quentin, that Mr. Siggs wishes to see you by the lake tonight. Quentin jumped from his seat. How could I forget? Come help me dress myself, Cordelia. I shall have to go without my tea. Quentin usually took his time dressing up to go out, trying on various waistcoats, slicking and unslicking his hair, spritzing every perfume bottle until he found the scent that fit the mood of the evening. But tonight he did not have time for such luxuries. Cordelia was in an unstable mood and wished to leave Quentin so she might go and prepare dinner. Besides, Mr. Siggs would probably not even notice the queer turn in the weather, let alone whether his companion wore a waistcoat with a brown or red edge, and what thickness was the chain of the stopwatch decorating it. So he opted for a smart black waistcoat and blazer, his favourite stopwatch, which was a little worn, and a sensible bowler hat. Cordelia flew around him like a hummingbird, dressing him with such unnecessary haste that she nearly popped off a button, so finally he shooed her away and dressed himself. "'I'm off!' called Quentin as he stepped out of the house. He heard some goodbyes from his fellow holidaymakers, as well as the sound of Cordelia shuffling around in the pantry like a rat. Outside, the air was heavy and damp and seemed to crackle, as if it might explode into a thunderstorm at any moment. The cloud covered the entire lake precisely, like a tablecloth. Good thing I brought my umbrella, Quentin mumbled, and with a smile on his face, made his way down the rocky path. 
Usually, Quentin would walk to the top of the small hill a few minutes down the path, and peering over the edge, he would wave to Mr. Siggs, who would be sat on the pebbles reading a book or staring into space. Yet again, the cloud ruined his usual routine, and at the top of the hill he was surrounded by thick fog on all sides and could not see below. Goodness, what unchanging weather we have today, he muttered to himself as he carefully navigated the path. Had Cordelia informed me, I would have brought a Macintosh, and now I fear I shall be soaked through when I come to meet the venerable Mr. Siggs. As he climbed down the hillside, Quentin could not push down a feeling of terror. It started in his stomach, the size of an acorn, and gradually expanded, laying roots and grumming branches and vines which curled up his throat so that when he tried to make a cheery remark or sing a tune to himself, only a strangled mumbling fell off his lips. When Quentin reached the lake, He was both relieved and puzzled. It had felt so much like purgatory, that walk from the house, that he found himself somehow disappointed not to arrive at heaven or hell. He looked around him, but could barely see a metre in front of his face. Quentin, called a deep voice through the fog. Quentin jumped. It was Mr. Sig's voice, of course, but the queer atmosphere made it sound different. Demonic, even. Where are you? Quentin howled. I am here. Quentin turned around and let out a shriek. Just inches away from him stood Mr. Siggs, his unnaturally smooth face glittering in the fog like salt crystals. That peculiar beard of his, which hung in two lumps from his chin, and yet was almost as smooth as the rest of his face, wriggled, one side after the other, like two fat slugs. His lips, the pieces of skin were so thin and pale that Quentin would hesitate to even call them that, curled into a wicked smile. I apologise for frightening you, dear friend. That's quite all right, sir, Quentin said with a cheery laugh. Terrible weather we're having, isn't it? No, you are not a bit at fault for my surprise. It is the cursed precipitation that is to blame. Yes. Mr. Siggs ran a hand over his face. His skin vibrated like gelatin. He often did such a gesture. It appeared that he was wiping off excess sweat or moisture, but in reality his face grew visibly wetter afterwards. It is in relation to this weather that I have called you here. He looked up at the cloud. Now that they were below it, Quentin could make out a thin outline of something moving inside it, something circular and obscure. Oh? Have I the good fortune of receiving another one of your inspiring lectures? I would be deeply appreciative. You have already taught me so much. Not a lecture. An invitation of great importance. My, we are in a dramatic mood today, aren't we? said Quentin, then hesitated, as he was not sure the teacherly tone was welcome or appreciated by his companion. He added... I suppose it is this weather. Funny how the simplest things can drastically change us. How unstable human minds are. It is not the weather, Mr. Siggs replied dryly. Though dry was a poor word to describe the man. Everything about him was slick, even slimy. His voice in particular sounded like a Wellington boot landing in cow dung. Oh? Have you by chance taken ill? My mission is almost at its end. Your mission? I had no idea you were a religious man, though now that you mention it, it makes a great deal of sense. At which parish do you preach, father? Mr. Sig's face folded and unfolded, his black olive eyes squeezed and his beard did a little dance. Quentin finally realised what the two lumps of hair reminded him of. Crab claws. 
My mission is of great importance to you and your entire planet. Are you a journalist? A spy? A soldier? I cannot aid you if I know not your purpose. Speak now. Nobody shall hear us in the fog. The olive eyes began to water. I am not sure you are ready. Quentin found his patience was rapidly deteriorating. He had entertained this man with all his whims for almost four weeks now. Had he not been a most gracious host? Had he not earned the right to gain some information about the mysterious Mr. Siggs? And what must I do to prove myself? Sir, I remind you that I am here vacationing and that you are no more, presumably, than a temporary acquaintance of mine. Any task you have for me, providing it is as demanding as you suggest, I am well justified to dismiss, even outright reject. Quentin paused, sensing he had gone too far. Oh, damn my tongue, he cursed himself. But Mr. Siggs did not react, aside from an unreadable spasm of the shoulders. So Quentin continued, Please do not misunderstand me. I am exceedingly grateful for the knowledge you have passed on to me. I have not heard such fascinating lectures on the cosmos from Oxford professors themselves, and your account of intergalactic battles, while humorously presented as fact rather than fiction, are stunning. You have shared a lot with me, but I am afraid all I can offer you in return is my friendship. Will that be sufficient? Mr. Siggs pondered for a minute and then gave a gargled sigh. No, but it shall have to be. Quentin felt a deep vibration. Above him, the cloud twisted violently and the dark shape within it began to descend. Cordelia stood by the great window until late into the night. The great cloud had evaporated around 10pm, at which time an audible sigh of relief passed through the household. But Quentin had yet to make his return. Why, Cordelia, Alicia said almost mockingly, you look like a wife awaiting her husband's return from the war. Don't worry so much about Quentin. I'm sure he's simply gone to spend the night at the Robinsons. Or perhaps his new friend has a beach house that they've decided to sleep in. Don't say such wicked things, Cordelia snapped at her. She did not appreciate the nature of this woman, one of Thomas's girls who hung around him like flies, and she especially did not appreciate the suggestions made about her master's habits. It was none of her business, and certainly none of Alicia's. He said he would be back at the same time as usual, Cordelia said coldly. Well, men are often loose with their word, I find. She yawned, her mouth gaping open in a most unfeminine way. I merely came down to collect my gloves, but I cannot sleep with a good conscience knowing you are down here, alone with no fire, awaiting Quentin until the early morning. There is quite enough warmth left from this afternoon's fire. This was not true, and Cordelia had to resist the temptation to pull her scarf tighter against the chill. Do come up to bed, Alicia said, laying a hand on her shoulder. You will, won't you? It'll be so awful here in the dark and cold. I shall light more candles, Cordelia said, eager to move away from the girl's touch. But then she remembered that she had left the box of matches in the kitchen at the end of a long, dark corridor, where gloomy portraits stared down from either wall, which even she felt some superstition about. Oh, all right, if only to still your worries. Wonderful. Alicia linked arms with Cordelia and walked with her to the door. There was something charming in that naive youth, that simple joy of doing things together, anything together, that allowed Cordelia to forgive Alicia's perseverance. They tripped once or twice on the stairs, and Alicia started to laugh so much that Cordelia worried she might wake Humphrey. Dear me, what a state you are, Cordelia whispered bitterly once they were safely on the landing. Now do quieten down and go to sleep. Oh, Cordelia, I will so miss the villa. 
as shall we all, but one can hardly spend all year going for walks and reading. With that, she shooed the girl into her room and climbed into bed herself, her tired bones creaking along with the old mattress. Quentin did not return, not the following morning, nor any morning afterwards. A thorough search was held of the valley, the lake, and the surrounding countryside, but not a hare was found. Mr. Siggs had disappeared as well, though when the holiday makers made inquiries with the locals about the man, they received vacant stares. As far as the people of the valley were concerned, he had never existed. The strange cloud over the lake was never explained, but it was soon forgotten about by all except for Cordelia. She took Quentin's disappearance the hardest. Even after the group's return to England, she often wandered the roads at night as if he might show up at any moment, singing to himself, unaware of how long he had been absent. She frequently stopped and stared up at the stars, but they did not reveal any clues about where he was. You do realise that you're giving away your soul to me for eternity, don't you? The gentleman leaned his head over the luxurious seat. His long neck moved like a snake, underlining the question. Obviously, everyone knows about you. Yes, yes, the people gossip, but do you believe them? Zara cast a glance around the room and shrugged. Everything fits in with the rumours. And are you ready to work as my faithful servant? I'm ready to work. The monster stood up and his lips contorted into an unreadable expression. Whether it was a smile or a grimace, Zara didn't know, but she didn't care either. She took his outheld hand. No, no, we'll do it the old-fashioned way, like the foolish men in the backwater villages. Didn't you bring a knife? She raised an eyebrow. He went to a nearby table and searched through the piles of antiques, papers and animal bones until he clicked his fingers and pulled out of a drawer a long, elegant knife. Without hesitation, he cut his palm and scarlet blood dripped onto the carpet. Do you want me to do it for you, little girl, or can you do it yourself? Zara grabbed the knife and copied him. She ignored the disgust she felt when the old thing put its hand on hers, joining their lives and souls through that ancient ritual. I think we're going to do good work together, he said. They drank the life of everything and everyone. No place was too sacred for their activity. In churches, in graveyards, in shops and offices, even in conferences where people spoke strange languages and discussed the meaning of life, they crawled in the shadows and feasted on the life force of humanity. People didn't feel it, of course, apart from a piercing cold or a prickly déjà vu. The easiest victims were the businessmen and marketers. They had built up a wealthy, comfortable life with numbers and deals, and no longer needed to keep the old superstitions and gods alive, those backwater things. So when the monstrous gentleman and his assistant visited their huge buildings and smoky caves, they hardly noticed that someone was sucking the most intimate and important aspect of their beings from them. Zara always believed love was special before, but now she understood it better. It was abundant and cheap, banal even. She guzzled it greedily, and her master clearly valued that in her. He had finally found someone with as few scruples as him. For his part, the master was also very content. With such a capable partner, he began to push his limits more and more, chasing after bigger prey, winning in larger arenas, drinking his full at funerals and weddings. He wanted things to stay this way forever, but he understood that fate was a fickle beast. So when Zara invited him to her room one evening, the change in habit did not perturb him. She was spread out on the bed like a piece of good gossip in the countryside, and her nudity, alongside her sad expression, awoke a strange feeling in him. Compassion? No, he never felt that. 
sympathy, perhaps. What do you want? he said finally. You. I can't lie any longer. I have eaten my full during the past months, grew fat on the passion and pathos of humanity. I never guessed that such a range of love existed, expressed in such a variety of ways. I feel I can die happily now. Your words make me sad. Why must you speak of death when we live in an Eden of joy? She smiled flirtatiously. No, not flirtatiously. Something in her was different. She was above all those human traits now, like an angel. He was a child in her presence. Don't be sad. I'm offering myself up to you, and I am happy to do so. You should be happy too. I already gave my soul away to you, so all that rests is my emotions. Eat them, and I will leave this world happier than I ever was upon it. The master couldn't bear it any longer. So touched he was by her purity of heart, her deep, sincere love. He tore off his clothes and leapt onto the bed next to her, wrapped himself around her body as if she was the fountain of life itself. Zara moaned and accepted him, drank the flow of emotions which gushed from his skin. She caressed him slowly with her tongue, absorbed his sadness and joy, tasted and devoured his love. The monstrous gentleman discovered too late what was really going on. He shook, tried to detach himself from her, but her arms held him like a snake swallowing a rabbit. She devoured everything, his feelings, her lost soul, even his. She was an insatiable beast who drained his body of every last drop of its essence. She rolled over on the bed, discarding the now empty body like an apple core, and burped loudly. Previously, she would have claimed she couldn't possibly feel more fulfilled, more complete than she felt working with her master. But now she knew better. The deepest love is always hidden beside you, hunting its prey like a savage beast. Once there was a witch called Marabella who lived in a deep, dark forest. As with most witches, she was not actually evil, but she did magic, and so the people were afraid of her, and whenever there was a storm, or a bad harvest, or a child got sick, they said, it is the witch's anger. Marabella lived a quiet life. She had a black cat and a white cat, who always walked side by side, with their tails wrapped around one another's, like the night wrapped around a star. So she named them Starry and Night, and she loved them very much. The witch spent her days reading spell books, mixing potions, and gardening. Because everyone was so afraid of her, they never dared come near her house, and so she lived in peace. But Marabella was lonely. More than anything, she wanted someone to share her home with. With magic, she could create beautiful paintings, delicious food, and powerful potions. But she could not make another person. And as lovely as Starry and Night were, she grew tired of talking to creatures who could only say, Meow! But just as the world was afraid of Marabella, she too was afraid of the world. People confused her. They rejected her kindness and glorified her magic. And still, and still, the months and years passed, and no one dared enter into the dark, dark forest to visit her. She would live and die there, all alone, except for her cats and her plants. So one day, Marabella set off on a journey. She packed some bread and cheese, a bottle of wine, and a few potions, and set off with Starry and Night trailing behind her. For the first few days, she had a lovely time, wandering through the forest, picking berries and mushrooms. She knew this place well, and while she met no other humans, she did come across friendly creatures who were more than happy to see her. A witch is a friend to all of nature, although the townspeople would say the opposite. Soon, though, Marabella reached the edge of the forest and came across a farmer. At first, he greeted her, 
but when she introduced herself as Marabella, he ran away screaming. I will have to change my identity, it seems, she said. What do you think, Starry and Knight? What name should I go for? The cats just meowed, so she decided to call herself Mia. Soon, Mia came to a city. The people there walked with their heads bowed, and in the streets not a single word was said. The markets were dull and quiet, and even though Mia had never been in a city before, she instinctively knew that it should have been loud with the cries of marketplace sellers and friendly conversation. There was a dark and terrible atmosphere to this place, and the people even stared at her dear cats with suspicion. In the centre of the city stood a grand, coal-black castle, and when Mia went and asked who lived there, the guard said, What? You haven't heard of the great wizard Karluk? A wizard lives here? Not just any wizard, the most powerful wizard in the world! Mia was amazed. Here, they were not afraid of magic. She asked to see the wizard, but the guards laughed in her face. The wizard does not take audiences with little beggar girls. So Mia clicked her fingers and a flower appeared in her hand. Ha! said one of the guards. You might be able to do some simple tricks, but you can't do real magic like him. Mia sighed and lifted her arms in the air. For a moment, nothing happened, but then slowly, with plenty of concentration, she started to float. The guards stood with their mouths open as she floated higher and higher, sweeping past the walls of the castle. All the people inside pointed and stared at her through the windows. She flew up and up, right up to the tallest tower, where a man with wild black hair was working in a study. Hello, she said. The man jumped, having been absorbed in his writing. Who are you? he said, irritated. I am Mia, the witch of the dark, dark forest. And you are? The man stood up and bowed. I apologise. I thought that this was surely some trick, but I see that you are a talented user of magic, though perhaps not as much as I. I am Karluk, the king of this land, and I must say you are the most beautiful witch I have ever seen. Mia blushed, and the spell was broken, sending her falling to the ground. Luckily, she caught herself just in time, floating a metre above the ground and slowly descending. Starry and Knight hissed and pawed at her leg. You have quite a charming king, Mia said, and just then the doors of the castle opened and Karluk himself stood right there. The guards, still in shock from her display of magic, stood to attention at the sight of their ruler. My dear Mia, he said, are you all right? I'm fine, thank you. Brilliant. Then you'll be happy to join me for dinner tonight? Mia had no other plans, so she agreed and spent the rest of the day wandering around the city in a daze. Word of the incident spread quickly, and now the townspeople looked at her with a mixture of fear and admiration. That evening, she was taken into an impossibly long dining hall and greeted by Karluk, wearing colourful and expensive robes. Suddenly, Mia felt very common in her black dress. They were the only clothes she had, and they were nowhere near as elegant as Karluk's attire. They sat down and Karluk clicked his fingers. Two plates of beautifully cooked chicken appeared in front of them. Mia was amazed. Conjuration, making food and other objects appear in thin air, was not an easy form of magic. She could only conjure the flower because it came from her own garden, and she had loved and tended to that flower for many years already. As they ate, Karluk told her all about his kingdom. It was a prosperous land, because all the merchants, the rich men who travelled around selling goods, feared him. In fact, it seemed like everyone feared him, which kept the place running well. He had no council and no enemies, although he did not specify if this was by accident or design. But that is our privilege, is it not, as users of the magic arts, to guide the common folk who cannot understand the knowledge we have. Mia had never thought of herself as very special, 
Of course, she could use magic, and it seemed she could use it well if she had managed to impress someone of Carluk's importance. But she still lived in a house, ate food, worked and slept, just like everyone else. The only thing I really care for is my garden, she said, sipping on the wine at the table. It was bitter and sweet at the same time, and she only continued to drink it to be polite. Carluk smiled. Here you can have the grandest garden in the world, with fountains, hedge mazes, man-eating plants, and the sweetest smelling flowers. Mia, he said, taking her hand in his, won't you share my home with me? Mia felt a strange feeling in her chest, like a bird trying to escape a cage. I need some time to think. Of course, he said. But you will do me the honour of staying here tonight, won't you? We can talk more tomorrow. She agreed, and a servant led her to a beautiful bedroom. The bed was practically as big as her cottage, and there was plenty of space for her to curl up with starry and night. But Mia couldn't sleep. She imagined the grand garden he spoke of, and the thought of it hurt her head. Besides, She missed her flowers and her potions table, and she missed the mysterious sounds of the forest at night. Here in the castle, she heard nothing but the distant cries of drunk men. A grandfather clock struck midnight, and Mia got out of bed, opened the window, and climbed down the side of the castle. She slipped away with starry and night and left the city behind. Next, Mia wandered to the sea arriving in the early morning when it was dark and windy. She had never seen it before, and the crashing waves, loud seagulls, and knife-like rocks enchanted her. At first, she kept her distance, walking on the deserted side of the beach, which was covered with wood and rocks that had washed up from the sea. She climbed onto an old log, worn from the endless attack of the salt water, and wondered how it had gotten there. Starry and night stayed far away from the water, meowing loudly whenever the breeze blew it in their faces. The water was rough, and while there were a few brave swimmers, surely there could be nobody sailing the waters. But as Mia stared at the constantly shifting horizon, something began to emerge above the waves. It was a boat. As it came nearer, she began to make out its features. There were many men on it, holding on for their dear life, and a huge net full of something on board. What could it be? Mia muttered. Starry and Knight jumped forward, meowing excitedly. A moment later, Mia's weaker sense of smell caught up with theirs. Fish! She stood still, enchanted, as the brave fisherman pushed forward. For a while, it looked like they would never reach the shore, as every time they made a few metres, a wave pushed them back again. But slowly and surely, they came nearer and nearer, until finally they reached the jetty, and Mia could let out her inhaled breath. Let's go talk to them, she said, and she ran across the beach. She wasn't sure what had taken over her, but she felt a childish excitement at the prospect of seeing the men do their work. She was so used to reading old books and cutting up herbs that the heavy, involved labour of the fishermen filled her with energy. They climbed onto the jetty and watched. The men, bearded and wrinkled, pulled the huge sack of fish off the boat and started putting them into sacks to be taken away. For the most part, they ignored her, but one young man caught her eye. He had sandy red hair and he was considerably younger than the rest. He smiled at her and the fish in his hand slipped out and danced over the jetty, jumping back into the water. One of the older fishermen hit him on the head, and he continued his work with an embarrassed expression. After they bagged the fish, Mia followed them to the market, where the fish were handed over to merchants setting up for the day. The market had its own fascination, and her eyes wandered over the various stalls, many selling kinds of food and clothing that she had never seen before. You're from out of town, aren't you? She jumped, and Starry and Knight hissed at the fisherman. Or fisher boy, more accurately. He had to be a similar age to her, but there was an undeniable youth to his eyes. I am, she said, very aware of how different her accent sounded to his. 
You don't exactly look dressed for the sea, and that's the only thing people come here for. So what brings you? His accent was as salty as the seawater. I was looking for a change, to see the world and see its people. Well, I'm afraid you've already seen the most exciting part of here, he said, looking slightly embarrassed. Say, can I invite you to a fish dinner? I would love that, she said. He bowed to her, looking very childish as he did so, and went back with the fishermen, who were watching him and waiting. Mia spent the rest of the day looking at goods in the market and chatting to the friendly merchants, but she had not a penny to spend, and when the shopkeepers realised this, they became considerably less friendly. That evening, they ate in a small wooden cabin on the far side of town, near the sea. She could hear the waves crashing outside. The meal was simple, grilled mackerel with lemon, but it tasted just right for where they were just as the mushrooms from her home tasted right when she was there. Their conversation did not hold the same natural tone. Girk, the fisher boy, stared down into his food like a shy child and seemed to have no idea what to say. Mia wondered how such a brave, strong person could be so weak when it came to her. So, what do you do? he said. She chewed her food carefully and then said, I'm a witch. He choked, (coughs) and then laughed nervously. It's not a joke. (laughs) Don't worry, I'm a good one. His eyes went wide. Really? You can do magic? Mia smiled and waved her hand over her face. Her features changed in an instant, her lips replaced with the oily mouth of a fish. She opened and closed them a few times before returning her true form. Girk stared with his mouth open, dropping a piece of mackerel on the floor which Starry and Knight fought over. Oh, you're amazing! The guys will love you if you show them that. You could do a show in town and make buckets of money. Hmm, but I don't want to. What are you talking about? You could be rich! Most people have never met a witch or wizard in their life. Mia felt uneasy, as if she'd just swallowed a fishbone. I just want a quiet life. Girk shook his head. Well, you're in the right place then. Sure, fishing might look exciting, but that's all there is around here. We get plenty of visitors, of course, but they don't want to talk to us local people. Well... You'd be the talk of the town here. Mia finished her meal and said good night. She went out to the beach and stared up at the moon. Somehow it looked so much more beautiful above the raging water. She stood there so long that nobody else remained outside, only her and the cats. What do you think, Starry and Knight? Could I share a home with him? The cats cleaned themselves and did not answer. Mia sighed, picked up her belongings and hit the road. Next, Mia came to a dark cave. She wanted to be alone for a while, and it seemed that wherever she went outside of the dark forest, she found people, but in the black depths of the cave, she found her solitude. The caves went deep into the earth, and she discovered things there she had never seen before. Shining rocks and underground waterfalls, hairy bats that looked like bent old men, and stone sculptures of powerful dragons with rocky jaws. Mia loved the caves just as much as Starry and Night hated them. She climbed over the rocks, threw magic lights up into the yawning spaces above her, and dipped her toes into the icy waters. I could almost stay here forever, she said, stroking the shivering cats but I love the plants and the trees of the forest too much. And she felt a great sadness in her heart, for through all her travels, she had not found one person who she cared for as much as the flowers in her garden. You don't belong here! Starry and Knight jumped so violently upon hearing the voice that they fell into the river below and crawled out shivering. 
Mia turned to see a short, thin girl standing behind her. She was dressed in black rags, and she had wild, forest-green hair that went down to her knees. I'm sorry, said Mia, standing up and bowing. I did not think there was... The girl stepped forward and grabbed her hand. For a long moment, she stared at Mia's fingers, and all that could be heard was the sound of the magic light that floated above their heads. You're a witch, she said flatly. How did you know? Herb fingers, the girl grunted. Mia inspected her own fingers. It was true that there were spots of green permanently dyed under her fingernails from all the mashing and cutting of herbs she undertook. This ragged cave girl was the first to comment on it. I don't want any trouble, said the girl. When are you leaving? She started walking off, and for a moment Mia stood there, as if frozen. You're a witch too? Obviously, grunted the girl. She spoke with a low, throaty voice, as if her own voice was foreign to her. Then let's be friends, she snorted. Why do you think I live in a cave all alone? I don't need friends. The girl jumped off the edge of some rock, and after a few seconds of silence, a splash came from below. Mia looked over the edge, but the water was too far down for her to see, and she didn't dare follow. She hated being told to leave in such a rude way. After all, these caves were huge, and it wasn't every day that you met another witch. So she continued exploring the caves, and later on, just when Mia had finished her dinner and was thinking it was about time to head to the outside world, she came across the cave girl again. For a moment, she felt the hope of them making up, but then the girl spoke. I told you to leave. I am leaving, she said, irritated, getting up and telling Starry and Knight to follow her. She wasn't going to stay any longer in this cave if this was to be her reception. She marched away, but just as she was turning the corner, the girl cried, Wait! What? snapped Mia. Why did you come here? Mia blushed and said, I was looking for other people. I live alone, although in a very nice little cottage, and I have two charming cats to keep me company, so I'm not nearly as cold as you. Then she felt that she had said too much and covered her mouth with her hand. The cave girl just laughed. (laughs) I'm Hula. At least, that's what they used to call me. It's been a few decades since I spoke to anyone. It also looked like it had been a few decades since she had washed herself, but Mia told herself to be nice. And why did you go into the cave in the first place? I can't imagine you were born here. No, I got tired of being driven out of town. I was never quite able to keep my magic in check. One time, a pig broke into my house and stole one of my potions. She went bright red like a tomato and started breathing fire. Mia laughed and Starry and Knight started pouring at her legs. They wanted to leave but she had changed her mind. Hulla wasn't so bad after all. I'm Marabella, though I've been going by Mia. I thought keeping to myself would keep me safe, but it seems my name has spread quite far throughout the land. Can't say I've heard of it, but it's nice to meet you. They smiled at each other, and a painful silence hung in the air. Well, uh, you must want to be getting back to your journey. Don't let me keep you. Come walk with me a while. Outside? Her face, which so far had only been coloured with annoyance, took on a childlike innocence, and she hid in her hair. I don't know how long it's been. I don't measure time here. Well, it's always a good time to watch the stars, hey? So they climbed out of the cave together, starry and night running ahead, thrilled to be leaving the dark, wet caverns. When they came out, it was indeed night time, and there was a magnificent carpet of stars to be seen. Hulla stood at the entrance of the cave and looked uneasily around. Funny, that 
town wasn't there before. She nodded her head at the horizon, where there was a rough outline that Mia could only vaguely recognise as where she'd come from earlier that day. Come on, she said, running and doing a roll on the grass. A great energy had filled her, but she couldn't tell why. But Hulla just stood there, and when Mia finished her cartwheeling and turned around, she was halfway back inside the cave. Mia ran to her and grabbed her arm. It's easy, I'll... Get off me! Hulla cried, tearing her arm away. There it was again, the animal stare, the sharp teeth bared. And in the corners of her eyes, tears were forming. Mia stepped back. I'm sorry. I guess it has been a long time for you, huh? Hula stared at her feet and sniffed several times. <laughs> willing the tears back inside her, but it didn't work. They fell onto Mia's toes. Let's watch from here, Mia said, sitting down on the ground within the cave, but close enough to see the stars. She expected Hulla to turn back and run into the cave the moment she turned her back, but to her surprise, Hulla sat down next to her. They are beautiful, like the shining rocks down there, but a thousand times denser. She made an mm noise and shut her mouth, embarrassed of what she said. That's very poetic, said Mia and smiled at her. They sat there for a long time, in silence and stillness, and then Hulla moved suddenly, grabbing Mia's hand. Mia said, oh, and the other girl immediately dropped it, hiding back in her thick head of hair. I'm sorry, I, I get so lonely in the caves. I, I, I should go. She jumped up, but Mia grabbed her wrist. Please, sit down again. The stars haven't said goodbye yet. Hulla opened her mouth and then smiled and sat down with her. They held hands and then Hulla put her arm around Mia and then Mia sat in her lap and time itself seemed to disappear. There were just the two of them staring up at the shining stars reflected in each other's eyes, feeling the warmth of the world and each other's arms until the stars put on their jackets and retired for the night and the sun came huffing and puffing over the horizon. I think I'm ready to leave, Hulla said hoarsely. For good. There's room for two in my house. Well, it'll be four with Starry and Night. You'll really share your home with me? Mia felt her heart cry out, for she had never met someone as lonely as Hulla, and before she could stop herself, she kissed the girl, and she tasted the deep, dark warmth of the earth. Flowers grew at their feet, and stalactites grew from the ceiling of the cave, and starry and night sang sweet songs in harmony. Yes, please come home with me, said Marabella. Marabella went home with Hulla, and they lived happily ever after. Once upon a time, there was a talented cello player. She loved her cello like a son and practiced on it for hours every day. Sometimes she concentrated so hard that she could practically see the notes floating in the air around her. But one day, as she sat down to practice before breakfast, she was met with a rude surprise. As she put the bow to the strings, the cello spoke. Hey! I was still asleep, you know. What time do you call this? The woman gasped. You can talk. And you have ears. Now, why don't you go eat your breakfast so I can get in ten more minutes? She dropped the bow, stepping away from the cello and rubbing her eyes. I know, I know, said the cello. I'm a real beauty, aren't I? How is this possible? Magic, I expect. You say that as if it's the most normal thing in the world. Well, I'm the cello. It's normal for me. How long have you... 
Suddenly, she thought about how she practiced in the room. It was her own little world where she went around singing with her awful voice, making terrible jokes and swearing whenever she played a wrong note. Not exactly appropriate behaviour for a professional cellist. If her cello had seen all that... I don't know. It happened some time last night, I expect. Good, so he hadn't seen her behaviour. She thought back to last night. She had been practising before bed, and she was really in the spirit of it, hitting Beethoven's cello sonata number three with everything she had. And what, you just came to life? Larkar said, magic. Because I played so well? she said, smiling. Mama, you must be the most humble cellist in the world. I'm not sure why I came to laugh. I'm just a cello after all. The woman thought about it for a moment. Sure, it was strange, but wasn't this perfect? She had always wished for a music partner, and who better than her very own instrument? Well, If you're going to live under this roof, then you're going to have to get used to me practicing day and night. That's just how I live. And what if I say no? You're a cello. What are you going to do? And with that, she sat down and started playing. But the cello, clearly eager to show her just what he was capable of, started producing a horrible scratchy notes. It was as if the strings were working against her, fighting with the bow to produce the worst sounds possible. Unacceptable, she screamed, standing up. I have a recital soon. You must behave. Can't you play another cello? She gripped the bow so tightly in her hand she thought it might break in two. She had never played another cello, not since she'd found this one. But desperate times called for desperate measures. Fine then. She went into the kitchen and ate a furious breakfast of muesli, spilling half of it on the floor before running to her car and pounding the pedals to the nearest music store. She made sure to find exactly the same model of cello, a Cecilio CC0500, paid for it with her card and dragged it home. She deliberately sat opposite her old cello to play the new one. The talking instrument didn't say a single word as she played, just watching silently as she worked through some Bach. But although the notes came out at the correct tones, there was no sweetness to them. They were empty, an amateurish shadow of the beautiful work she had done just the night before. Finally, the talking cello could not resist speaking. What are you doing? My music sounds far better than that. Oh, you want to play now? I thought you were napping. I'm just saying, if I were to play music, it would be fantastic. So you're jealous. If you wanted to play together, you could have just said. She smiled as she spoke. It was like chatting with an old friend. The cello gave a woody sigh. I suppose I can't let you go and make a fool of yourself in that recital. You can play me, but under one condition. For someone who's been alive less than 24 hours, you sure are demanding. It's my brand, dear. I'm a professional cello. Now, as I was saying before you so rudely interrupted me, there is just one condition. This will be the last time you play me. What? said the woman, letting her newly purchased cello fall to the floor. After you do, you will take me to the forest and leave me there. The forest? Why would you want to go there? I'm made out of wood, aren't I? I want to return to where I was born. Oh, I wish you had never come to life. I must be the unluckiest musician in the world. Talent comes with a price, sweetheart. 
The woman pressed her lips together. She had loved her cello, poured her heart and soul into it. And apparently that was a mistake. Things would never be the same again. She looked down at the second Cecilio on the floor. For all intents and purposes, it was exactly the same as her old one, although much cleaner and newer. Could she learn to love a new instrument as she had her old one? Fine then, I agree to your plan. But secretly, she decided that this wouldn't be the last time. There was no way she could give up on this cello, which she had formed such a tight bond with. Her music would suffer if she did. No, instead she would show him why he had come to life. She would play so spectacularly that he would fall in love with the music as much as she did. There was no way he could produce sour notes forever. So the two began preparing for the recital. Every day they played together for many long hours. Thankfully, the cello cooperated and produced beautiful music, although he had to politely remind his player to go to the toilet, eat and even shower, or she'd spend all day sat down with a bow in hand. I don't understand you, said the instrument. Don't you feel hunger? Don't you smell yourself when you haven't showered for two days? When I start playing, I forget everything else. After many gruelling days of practice, the recital finally came. The cellist put on her finest clothes, carefully packed up her instrument and drove to the music hall. How are you feeling? She asked the cello as she drove. She had put the case on the seat next to her, like a real person. I'm nervous. Oh? She felt a bit relieved. She thought he would be making fun of her. I'm thinking about what it will be like in the forest. Will the trees accept me? I look so different to them. The cellist's heart sank. He was thinking of that now? Anyway, let's get this over and done with said the cello. The musician forced a smile. We're going to knock them dead. Despite the conflict between them, the performance went fantastically. The hours of practice had paid off and the cellist managed to recreate the ecstasy she'd experienced that night when she'd brought her instrument to life. Normally, her nerves prevented her from bringing through the joy she felt in practice, but this time she shone as bright as a star. As soon as she played the final note, a huge round of applause exploded from the crowd. They cheered and clapped for several minutes, giving her a standing ovation. The musician just stared at them, her mouth open, as if she couldn't believe it was real. Afterwards, she was rushed by photographers, journalists and fans, all the while gripping the cello and bow in her hands. It was only when she reached her car, several hours later, that she remembered the promise. You still want to go to the forest? She said, half hopeful that he would have changed his mind. She thought it was unlikely, and she didn't have the heart to keep fighting. Please, and spray some air freshener first. Those reporters were so sweaty. She laughed, did as she was told, and drove to the forest. She felt wounded, no doubt, but nothing could take away the ecstasy of the performance she'd just given. She parked on a small road, pulled out the case, and walked through the trees. In a few hours it would be dark, but she wanted to find somewhere hidden away, in case any humans came by. A while later, she found a quiet area with a tree stump, and satisfied with the location, she opened the case and carefully placed the cello in the middle. He looked strange, lying there in nature. He was made of the same wood that he rested on, and yet everything about him was unnatural. The tight strings, the holes on the sides, the sharp corners of the waist. She stood back, and a few birds came down to look at him before flying off to find something more interesting. How does it feel? she asked. I don't know. I feel like they're judging me. Hmm, why don't I play you? 
They'll love you once they hear your beautiful voice. Fine then, one last song. So she picked up the bow and cello, sat down on the stump and started playing. It was the most beautiful song of her life. Rather than the world disappearing around her, she felt like she became one with it, the notes melting together with the bird song and the sounds of the leaves. The music echoed out against the trees, shaking their branches. It pounded through the cold earth. It sang in the hearts of all the animals and became the very wind itself. When they finished, the cellist shed a tear. I suppose I'd better leave you now. She stood up, carefully returned the cello to the stump and walked away. She couldn't bear to look back or she would break down crying. Wait, said the cello. She turned around. Through the leaves above, a ray of light shone down on the instrument, lighting him up like an angel. I've changed my mind. I'll come home with you. I'll let you play me. Really? Her heart flew in the air. I mean, a cello in a forest looks pretty stupid, doesn't it? She laughed and the tears started to fall. She struggled to put the cello back in the case, her hands shaking as she did so. Once they were back in the car, she asked the question she had been thinking about ever since the cello first talked to her. Why didn't you want to play at first? You do it so beautifully. We all have our talents, but that doesn't mean we run towards them. It was hard for her to identify with that idea. She had always embraced the music, ever since she discovered it. I'll admit it. I was a bit worried about you. You were obsessed with music. You still are. But feeling you play me, I don't think anyone could take the music out of you. She reflected on her life. To her, it was perfect but she had struggled a lot to get there. To her friends and family, she was a disaster, barely capable of looking after herself. When she entered her music room and played, the hours and days flew by, the dishes piled up, dust covered the floors, and her hair turned into a bird's nest from lack of care. She barely went out, and the only attempts at romance she'd had ended in her dates running away to avoid hearing her say one more thing about music. When she was a child, a few years after she started playing, her mother stole the instrument and hid it in the attic, in an attempt to make the girl engage with the outside world and make some friends. Instead, the cellist had broken down, burying herself in her bed and refusing to come out. After several weeks, her mother reluctantly returned the instrument to her and she immediately went back to her old ways. What else could she do? She was in love with the music and nothing else mattered to her. Well, we have each other now. We've always had each other, said the cello. You're lucky I don't have eyes or I'll be crying and ruining my wood. She laughed and started up the car. From that day on, she never practiced alone.